Well, good morning, everyone. You guys are looking very good for 243 years, if I might say. <laughs> First, I'd like to thank General Ham, sir. It's always a privilege to be in your presence. And thank you so very much for this, uh, for, first of all, the kind introduction and for allowing me the opportunity to join you this morning. I also want to thank the whole of Team AUSA as I look from table one, two, three, and all the way back. Uh, lots of good friends in this audience, so thank you all so much for what you do, moreover, for your support of our men and women. So this week is the Army's 243rd birthday, Ooh. and uh, I must just tell you, I'm just uh, coming back from the DOD Warrior Games uh, that were hosted by the Air Force at the Air Force Academy. Uh, I got the opportunity to spend all day on Saturday uh, and uh, go to the closing ceremony with some absolutely amazing, and I mean amazing men and women, who throughout all of the joint services uh, were competing. And I think all of us who witnessed and bore witness to that, we couldn't help but our hearts swelled with great pride as we were so inspired by all of them who just refused to quit and keep that never quit attitude because they want to continually serve and to or transition into productive citizens outside the military. And uh, it just made me so grateful for the opportunities to serve this Army uh, for more than almost 37 years now. Sadly, this afternoon, we'll lay to rest a fallen comrade. I just ask that you would keep Major General Bannister's family in our hearts and our thoughts and prayers. Um, I tell you, um, Without a doubt, uh, I want to say thank you to each of you who raised your right hand and swore that oath of allegiance to serve this nation. But moreover, I want to thank all of you in this room for the support that you give to our men and women. And so on the occasion of this Army Birthday Week celebration, please join me in thanking our Army warriors, both past and present, present who helped transform this Army from its humble beginnings in 1775 to the global force that we've become today. How about a round of applause? No one does it better, in my view. So as General uh, Ham did mention as your axiom for short, I have the privilege every single day to, to join uh, teammates. Uh, Jordan Gillis is here in front of us. We've uh, recognized him. It's great to have you and Jerry here in the audience. But to, great, to join uh, Jordan Gillis as the uh, ASA for Installations, Energy, and Environment, uh, Mr. Will Williams, who was the acting or ASA for Manpower and Reserve Affairs, and Mike Powers, he's not here, but the ASA for Financial Management. And so working collectively, our mission is to provide the policy, programs, and resourcing for all things that have to do with installation management, and that's for the total Army, uh, the total force, active guard and reserve. So this morning, I thought I would talk briefly about installations today and into the future, tell you about how we do enable our senior leader priorities of readiness, modernization, reform, and caring for our service members and our people. So as we look toward enabling readiness, our installations today, as General Ham just said, are platforms, maneuver platforms for our Army. They are power projection and mobilization platforms, locations from where we project people and equipment to meet the needs of our combatant commanders. Our installations house our infrastructure and they provide the services where our soldiers live, train, deploy, and fight from. Within Team Maxim, again, we have the privilege daily to manage this global installation portfolio 156 installations across all the Army's components with an annual operating budget of $18 billion, sustaining well over 1 million soldiers and 2.2 million family members. Our portfolio supports everything you see on this chart. Infrastructure, ranges and land, base operation services, natural resource management and community services, and more. We enable unit readiness and improve soldier and family resilience by championing installation services where they live, they work, and where they train. So across this installation universe, you see, we endeavor to, all, to do all that we can to maintain focus categorically from all that you see, including 
power grids, utility roads, and dams. So we continue our focus on installation security and resilience, ensuring that our installations can maintain continuity of operations as it relates to secure power utility grids and utility infrastructure, which are all very critical to current operations. In support of modernization efforts, we continue to invest our military construction and restoration and modernization dollars into infrastructure that supports focused priority efforts. Increases in FY18 uh, did us really proud, and we were very happy and grateful for the monies we received in FY18. And what's on the hill now for FY19 will certainly go a long way toward improving our infrastructure particularly as we look at our barracks and our housing where our soldiers and families live. So our Secretary of the Army has challenged all of us to reform. Dr. Esper says uh, we need to reform the way that we are currently doing business now with an eye toward how we can gain efficiencies in order to optimize where and how we spend our dollars. From our universe chart, you can see that installations are in fact big business. Particularly as we grow this Army, we want to continue to be good stewards of government resources, optimizing every dollar we spend using reform initiatives that help us find ways to become efficient. So for example, Right Sizing Our Footprint initiative actually started uh, just about two and a half years ago. And it was then when commands identified excess infrastructure and facilities within certain categories. Uh, what we did was we consolidated our soldiers into our best facilities first with a purpose toward being able to rid ourselves of poor and failing condition uh, infrastructure. We called it then reduce the footprint. So if you fast forward now to where we are as part of our real property management reform, We've expanded this approach to what we call now right-sizing our footprint, looking at not only ridding ourselves of excess infrastructure, but at consolidating leases and using legislative um, authorities granted us to save dollars or to avoid costs. We know that sustaining excess infrastructure is costing us dollars, dollars that we can put to better use for mission-critical needs. So in FY18, again, uh, when it came to demolition, we were appropriated $98 million for demolition. I can tell you the FY19 press budget more than doubles that amount. So we want to see ourselves continuing the momentum of ridding ourselves of excess in future years. In the National Capital Region, we've made tremendous strides right-sizing our footprints in lease facilities, and I'm looking at Jerry O'Keefe there, because we've had tremendous success, and Jerry, we thank you, because we have reduced more than 2.8 million square feet over the last five to seven years, nearly 70% of our leases at a cost savings of $60 million per year, and Jerry, we thank you for your leadership in doing that. So as part of a DOD reform initiative engineered by our Air Force teammates. We are adopting the concept of category management within our facilities and infrastructure. And I'm looking at Jordan Smiling because he and I are heading up those efforts to be able to do that. Uh, category management, perhaps some of you have heard of it. It's an acquisition business model. We are applying within our facilities and our base operations such that we can buy smarter and much more like a single enterprise. So the notion being on an installation where you have multiple individual contracts, uh, being able to negotiate those from a standpoint of a single, perhaps, installation contract, or similarly, perhaps you have a single installation contract where those uh, contracts could be regionalized or perhaps uh, within MCOM even as a multi-installation approach. And so we think that's going to increase our buying power and certainly bring about efficiencies in the process. We're excited about the possibility of what category management can do inside of our portfolio, and uh, we know that we'll continue to build upon lessons learned as we go forward. But the end goal is to gain best, val best value for every dollar 
optimizing performance with benchmarking and garnering those efficiencies. So for sure, there's a lot on this Army Universe chart uh, that concerns us every day. But let me switch gears now for a bit. I want to uh, talk about our newest uh, initiative. Uh, we're all pretty excited about, uh, we're calling it planning for the installations of the future. Uh, Jordan Gillis and I and our collective teams, uh, again, are very excited about this initiative and uh, managing our infrastructure and implementing responsive services for our future installations. We know that that's going to require us to rethink our Army culture. Uh, academia, you and industry partners that are here among us and community leaders are certainly going to be a very key integral aspect uh, going forward for our installations of the future. So now I'd like to set the stage. I'd like to show a very short video to illustrate a little bit about what we are considering as we look forward to our installations of the future. Show the video, please. The time of spreadsheets is over. A Google search, a passport scan, a barcode reading in a supermarket, your online shopping history, an EKG reading, CCTV footage, a photo of a sandwich, a voice message, a tweet. All of these contain data that can be collected, analyzed, and monetized. Supercomputers and algorithms allow us to make sense of increasingly larger amounts of information in real time. In less than 10 years, CPUs are expected to reach the processing power of the human brain. A survey done by the Global Agenda Council on the future of software in society shows that people expect artificial intelligence machines to be part of a company's board of directors by 2026. There is a good chance that in 15 years your job is going to be performed by computers, since decisions once based on experience and intuition will be made through machine analysis of massive amounts of data. Think about a vehicle that is able to read its environment and react accordingly, much like a human driver, but also analyzing other sources of information that will make the trip safer, faster and more efficient. Analyzing vast amounts of medical data from different locations and demographics will allow to determine which conditions improve the effectiveness of certain treatments and which don't. Big data analysis will reveal patterns and connections that will vastly improve most human activities. But it will also create very detailed profiles for all of us, including information that we'd rather keep private. Will big data make privacy obsolete? Or will it bring transparency, accountability and progress? So what do you think? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so as we plan for our installations of the future, read that 2035 and beyond, we must change the way we look at installations. We believe incorporating some of the emerging technology that you saw depicted or alluded to in the film strip and to address the challenges from emerging requirements and threats. Threats like the increased number of attempted cyber attacks on our national infrastructure, banking facilities, and even on our installations will force us to think differently. Our intent is to take full advantage of technology to address these challenges for our emerging requirements in the future. The use of drones, sensors, cameras, and other technologies has the potential to greatly enhance the Army's ability to provide security on its installations. We also believe that fundamentally we must change our approach to installation management uh, to be able to adapt to the future and leverage these commercial technologies and cutting edge science and technology and as we receive feedback from the water fighter and our customer. So given that our culture drives how we see infrastructures and the way that uh, we will provide services in the future, we know that we must adapt and be open to new ways of doing business uh, particularly as we plan for these installations of the future. So just last month, my battle buddy, uh, Jordan Gillis, uh, he joined members of uh, Team Schofield Barracks uh, in Hawaii, had a ribbon cutting ceremony on a 50 megawatt multi-fuel power plant. I think this is really nifty. I like to talk about it a lot because I think it's the first of its time, of its kind on any Army installation. But this was a big partnership that the Army entered into. The Army provided the land, 
and uh, Hawaii Electric provided uh, or built the power plant and is uh, actually running it for the Army. And so what happens is the Army gets first call should there be some natural disaster or tsunami that strikes and there is a pro prolonged uh, power outage. Uh, the whole of Schofield Barracks will be able to continue its mission uh, for 30 days. It will fuel, power up not only Schofield Barracks, but uh, Wheeler Airfield, Field Station Kania, and a local hospital. And, and we think that is cutting edge, and certainly we see ourselves wanting to do more and more of those kinds of uh, partnerships in the future. And so we're mighty grateful that many of you in this room and your firms have invested in uh, the development and uh, proliferation of that Internet of Things uh, to make our processes more efficient and uh, at the same time save us dollars in cut and costs. And so we believe that the rapid growth in the Internet of Things and uh, the advancements made or being made in cloud computing and big data analytics will serve us well as we go about planning for our installations of the future. So let's imagine for a moment the use of artificial intelligence that was alluded to to the film strip and other smart cities, uh, smart cities technology such as autonomous vehicles uh, for transportation on a post, post camp or station or an installation. I know a number of folks had asked me and years gone past now when I was a garrison commander about could we get on post transportation? Could you see the use of autonomous vehicles being able to provide that for a bus or a vehicle? Imagine, imagine being able to use and analyze big data so that you could look at a building and be able to predict when it was going to need repairs. The fact or the premise there in saving costs is that it's better to replace a part than to have to replace the whole building. So being able to use big data analytics to help us do that, we see that very attractive in our installations of the future. Or how about entering through our access control points? And you all have experienced a number of things associated with that, but how about using advances, advances such as biometrics and sensors uh, to get in? We're now looking at new technology uh, that has to do with license plate readers and being able to take advantage of what our industry partners are learning from that. Uh, we hope to be able to conduct a number of pilots uh, on installations throughout the Army in the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, so stay tuned to that. I think Jordan's going to make some announcements at AUSA in October that get after some of that. But the Air Force has really recently undertaken a pilot uh, that they just had completed where they're using facial recognition and those license plate readers at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. So we want to uh, learn from them and uh, be able to continue uh, lessons learned uh, as we go about it. In February of this year, we had Dr. Stan Humphreys, who was founder of Zillow, uh, visited our team. And they shared insights that they were doing with smart cities technology, artificial intelligence, and data analytics. Uh, Zillow uh, provides that research free of charge to us. And so we're going to look at much of what they are doing to help inform how the Army is uh, using or working through its uh, housing portfolio. We already are using Zillow reports on housing and communities and cities that are outside our installations to help inform and support our stationing decisions. So you will recall that I began my comments earlier talking about the importance, that, the importance of culture uh, as we evolve to installations of the future. We believe uh, collectively that uh, we must begin that conversation, though, with the persons and people who are going to use that technology in 2035 and beyond, and that is none other than the millennials or post-millennials. And so to that end, we're very excited now to be working very closely with TRADOC. Uh, we are going to undertake a number of surveys uh, throughout the Centers of Excellence, talking through those and with those millennials and their family members about just what is it that they expect from their installations of the future. What services will our junior members want us to provide or need on an installation? Uh, what services can be provided off post rather than on the installation so that we can uh, rid ourselves of some of those non-core missions? 
Uh, for example, right now, child care referrals are currently conducted online. Can we extend the housing referrals to, or those referrals to housing, uh, social interest groups, grocery delivery, and other opportunities in each of our communities? Our going in belief is that our young millennials will want to have an app for this and an app for that because they, uh, they live like that. They're very digitally minded, as we all know, and they want the services at their fingertips. And so we're going to look to see what forms of apps we can make available on our smartphones and uh, interacting kiosks in the community areas. So we need uh, to continue to use uh, industry's best practices as we go forward and uh, we're part and ex are, are very excited to have you go along with us. So at Fort Meade, um, for example, again, the Army took a very modern approach to um, single housing, single soldier housing by building privatized apartment style living complex within our family housing areas. And the former garrison commander is right here, Brian Foley, who knows all about that. Uh, but we want to question are there benefits to privatizing barracks or adopting dorm-style living, uh, very similar to what's being happened at uh, William & Mary in academia? Would it improve soldier readiness to assign roommates based on matching software, perhaps? So we know the key to promoting change in culture is promoting opportunities for collaboration. And I think collaboration is a very pow powerful word in point of fact, I would always find myself saying as a former garrison commander and senior commander, there's absolutely nothing we do inside our gates without the full support and partnership of our academia, our industry partners, and community leaders outside our gates. And from where we sit, installations of the future will indeed be able to optimize these partnerships going forward, and we're very excited about that. In addition to the new technologies that are out there and those that will emerge over the next few years, we believe that partnerships modify or magnify our collective strength. They offset our individual weaknesses and they are cat the catalyst for future change and capabilities. And so partnerships will be around for an essential part of our future. So I'd like to uh, talk about a couple of future events that are happening. Uh, associated with our journey, uh, installation of the future journey, and you can see those portrayed on the chart. Uh, next week, we'll be at Tradox Mad Scientist event down in Atlanta. Uh, we'll be very, very excited to be able to engage with academia and industry partners there to really take advantage of some of the technology that our academia partners are doing and to be able to learn from them. Uh, General Ham, we're excited as always to join you, sir, and your team in October uh, at AUSA Expo. I think, again, uh, Mr. Gillis will have some announcements to talk about a uh, future industry day. Uh, we were asked about one, and so uh, we're looking to put a timeline on the calendar so you'll see more of that. And we hope to see many of you at these events. I must say that we are mighty excited uh, about leveraging all of this great and wonderful technology. But I must say at the end of the day, uh, make no mistake, by far, our greatest asset now and into the imaginable future is our people. The soldiers, civilians, and families who comprise our ranks. Truly, they are our crown jewels and our national treasures. So I'd like to close with one a very short video. Many of you may have seen it already. Uh, it illustrates what is possible through technology today. I ask that you and your teams insert your own company into this type of scenario as we chart our course forward toward installations of the future, and we look forward to you being a part of this journey as we go. Please show the video. Hey. Pass, please. I'm here to fix the elevator. Nothing's wrong with the elevator. Right. But you want to fix it. Right. So who sent you? New guy. What new guy? Watson. My analysis of sensor and maintenance data indicates elevator three will malfunction in two days. There you go. You still need a pass. <laughs> General Ham, we just want to let you know, sir, you will never be replaced by artificial intelligence. Thank you all so very much. I look forward to your questions.
Miss Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> More to come, I'm sure. Um, so General Bingham, you, you talked about um, the right-sizing effort coming, uh, following on to the previous effort. I'm just wondering whether you can elaborate a little bit more on what that really entails and how that fits into DOD's broader real property reforms um, and, and any costs that you can, you can outline for us in terms of the sustainment of excess infrastructure? Yeah, that's a great question. And certainly it is a big part, Courtney, of uh, DOD's reform initiatives. And point of fact, uh, I briefed uh, uh, the DCMO probably about a month ago last month on what we were currently doing in the Army. And so um, we took upon that uh, reduce the footprint effort, just as I mentioned, uh, just shy of three years ago. And then we were more narrowly focused on a certain category of facilities, while at the same time we wanted to consolidate our soldiers into our best facilities first and then rid ourselves uh, of uh, poor and failing infrastructure. Going forward, what we see ourselves doing is, expand, is expanding on what we did years ago to uh, what we're terming right-sizing. And by that, I mean it's a combination of not only continu con continually reducing excess but it's also ridding ourselves of uh, leases. I mentioned to you before the uh, magnanimous success that we've had uh, in consolidating our leases where we are 70 percent uh, out of what we started with uh, five to seven years ago. And uh, we've been given some NDAA authority in both 17 and 18, one specifically uh, conversion authority. So instead of uh, using precious MILCON dollars, we're able to u re use restoration and modernization dollars to be able to convert facilities to other multi-purpose use um, functionalities so that we won't have to use our MILCON dollars. So that's just a number of things that we are on uh, continually ongoing within uh, the building, and we are seeing success with it. Thank you for the question. Others? General Bingham, could you talk a little bit about uh, the Army's view and the, the future of joint basing? That's a great question. <laughs> Joy Carrera is sitting back there certainly uh, smiling. Uh, you know, uh, I must say that uh, joint basing uh, was done in, in the way of being able to bring about efficiencies, and so we have 12 of them around the uh, world, uh, including Joint Base Marianas. Um, in the Pacific. And so uh, did it accomplish, uh, has it been accomplishing its intended purpose? Its intended purpose was to save dollars and bring about efficiencies. I must say that uh, when it comes to that C word I talked about, culture, uh, from time to time we get a lot of negative press on culture and being able to change culture. So we are relooking joint basing. Uh, no decision has been made about it, but uh, we certainly want to ensure that it's doing what its uh, intended purpose uh, was to do. So we're relooking it right now, General Ham. Thank you for the question. I see you. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Devin Suits, our news. Hey, quick question. You mentioned that you're trying to set uh, installations up for modernization or for the millennials. You're looking at working with them to see the future of military installations. Right. As a millennial's age, their their tastes, their atmosphere, their whole environment and culture, as you mentioned, will also change. How are you going to continue to progress with future generations to make sure that the installations that we have for 2035, we'll carry over to 20, you know, 65, yes. 2085. Sure, that's a great question. I think it's a, a, a consistent heartbeat that we have even now to listening to the voice of the customer, uh, being able to uh, make a steadfast, uh, uh, precise um, effort now. As I mentioned, we're um, working with TRADOC through all the COE centers of excellence to be able to hear the voice of the millennials. But we're looking beyond that. When I talk about millennials, I also mention post-millennials. And so whether we use a, mech, uh, a survey mechanism or a face-to-face, -face, we want to continually understand what the needs and wants are of our service members as well as their families. So uh, DOD, I believe, will take this on on the family side of the house uh, with the, so the services that we're currently providing to our families 
And I see ourselves being able to continue that momentum for what we learned with this first initial wave. Thank you. Courtney. Um, you talked about installations and, and sort of the accident portfolio uh, supporting senior leader priorities. And, and so I'm just interested to know how, um, how you'll support the modernization priorities. You know, per, certainly uh, training ranges mm -hmm. need to adapt as the Army shifts toward this full, this full spectrum fight. Um, but Sec Army has also talked about um, increasing the size of the force. So uh, can you give us a little bit of a, more of a sense of, of how that modernization and, and potentially end strength growth is going to be supported as well? Yeah, it's a great question. And we sit as a part of all of the stationing decisions that are made. Uh, I have people that sit on those task force along with G3, making sure that uh, we have a sense for understanding uh, what the Sec Army and the Chief are seeking in uh, our future efforts. Uh, I may mention that we're using our military construction dollars as well as restoration and modernization dollars to help really prioritize where those modernization efforts are. So uh, there's nothing that really happens uh, inside any line of effort without installation management, that being the facilities that will support those efforts, the training ranges, the lands, all of that is part of the installation portfolio. So we are very much a part of those uh, conversations and very much a part of the task force that makes it happen. Thank you. Okay. SMA Preston. Hi, ma'am. Good uh, morning. Man, we talked earlier about, uh, about budgeting. And as the Army goes through now with the six priorities and, and with the cross-functional teams that are operating out there, what's the impact now on installations and uh, you know, the budgeting process to keep installations where they are or improve. Sure, that's a, that's a great question, SMA. And uh, I will tell you that uh, when I was testifying on the Hill both last year and this year, uh, we know that we have taken risk in our inside of our installation portfolio, but we, I must say, FY18's budget, we all did somersaults and corp <laughs> cartwheels because it was such a significant increase in our budget. And if we see what uh, we are seeing on in the president's budget on the Hill for FY19, we continue that momentum. And for the first time in a long time, we begin to arrest the facility degradation. Uh, inside this portfolio, what helps and hurts us, we are helped by increases, substantive increases. Uh, we are hurt when those uh, increases are eroded uh, one year or two years later. So what we hope to do is to be able to continue the momentum so that uh, such that we can keep up with the uh, facilities and that we can continually provide the services that our service members and families so dearly deserve. Thank you for the question. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 